Hi, this is Daniel Lanois, and we're answering some questions from folks who want to know about the creative process. Martha's here with me. She's holding the camera, and so I'm going to move the mic to her mouth while she reads this question. Let's see if that still works. Here you go, Martha. So this is a question from Chris Wright from UK, and he asks, um, Hi, Daniel. What is it about music that speaks to us in a way which transcends language? Cheers, Chris. Uh, hi, Chris. Thank you for your question. Um, I think our appreciation of music is primal. Um, I'm sure people were beating on logs and blown through uh, antlers long before they decided to be poetic. Um, you know, we, we appreciate, um, you know, the power of the language, obviously, you know, uh, I really enjoy proposing a toast and there's a lot of, there's a lot that comes um, from language, you know, in, in terms of spontaneity, that can be a lot of fun, obviously, as well as how we communicate. But um, I've also appreciated uh, instrumental music for its capacity to speak a universal language. So you might be um, from Brazil and, and, you know, you hear a note from a trumpet or from a steel guitar or whatever it might be and it will touch you without speaking a specific tongue of Brazil. Um, and the deeper we got into this steel guitar music, I realized that it, it held a lot of emotion in it. Uh, what I'm talking about is, is this record, Goodbye to Language, which we made for Anti Records in Los Angeles. Uh, my buddy Rocco De Luca and I uh, jumped on our instruments this was after a European tour where we sang a lot of songs and we were happy to get back to the nest to just play. And um, I felt at the time that we had um, a communication that was significant and I wanted to make sure that we captured it um, in the recording studio. Uh, what we did was uh, we performed long jams. Sometimes I called out chords and um, it meant that everything was fresh and there was some kind of courage at the basis of it. So I'm a supporter of instrumental music, you know, I, I came up listening to a lot of jazz records and I, and I appreciated those records for having uh, a lot of punch, a lot of emotion in them uh, without any lyric. Um, of course we love lyric, you know. Uh, I've been lucky enough to have made a couple of records with Bob Dylan, speaking of lyrics, and uh, I love Bob and I, I, I I like those records we made quite a bit, and I hope to get back to the lyric um, one of these days. But uh, there it is. I think Goodbye to Language um, speaks uh, uh, a universal language, and we can get specific otherwise, maybe on the next record or the one after that. Yeah, man. This question is from Bob Setchville from Switzerland, and he's asking, prefer playing or producing while in the studio? Hi, Bob. Thanks for your question. Um, what's happened in the last few years is that it's all bleeding into one. When we're in the recording studio, it's very performance-oriented here these days. And we imagine how we might be able to bring some of those sounds to the stage. And um, in recent times, I've brought a little eight-track player um, that houses some of the studio sounds, some of the preparations. And so we were able to get on with some of these uh, electronic um, um, pieces of music l l in a live setting. So, for example, uh, the little A track, one of the tracks will be a time reference for the drummer, um, whether that be my buddy Brian Blade or Kyle Crane. Um, Kyle's really good at playing to metronomic time, so he loves doing all that. So we feed the drummer um, a component from the little A track, and then um, I have my dubbing equipment on stage and my echo machines, so I can send uh, any of those um, source sounds, let's call them, that were prepared in the studio, to the machines, and you'll get a kind of a wild, explosive sound coming out of nowhere. Um, and then we combine those with hand-played sounds on the stage um, that are specific to the night, obviously, you know, if we're 
if we're improvising and we're doing hand played instruments, then we can we can take the compositions wherever they want to go. Um, a lot of what we're doing uh, with the computer driven music is instrumental, so there's there's a lot of flexibility that lives outside of the conventional song arrangement. Um, this is exciting for us because um, I get to do some of what I do in the studio in a live setting, and um, um, and it's always a surprise. Uh, we're not cookie cutter in our in our arrangements, um, so it's not as if you're going to hear the very same thing from from night to night. You know, we 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 allow ourselves a window of flexibility. Um, and so the more I travel and the more I meet people, um, the more I realize it's all bleeding into one. We love the recording studio, but we like to keep the studio action-packed. Uh, even in the most uh, conservative setting, I keep two MPEG uh, SVT bass cabinets pointing at my head. I've got a John Meyer back speaker system that can get me bleeding at the eyeballs. Um, I'm still blazing my steel guitar through a Vox AC30 and, and a, a Tweed Deluxe 1958. Um, will also um, cause blood to go to the eyeball. Um, and what happens is uh, then the studio becomes an engine room. It starts having a personality of its own. It becomes its own breathing dragon. And uh, that's when things start getting fantastic and out of control. And some lovely harmonic explosions come from that. We like to take them to the stage if we've succeeded in the studio. Um, and so in regards to your question, it's not as simple as it used to be. Um, we love the stage as much as we love the studio. And the more that I do it, the more it all becomes one. Yeah, man. Johan de Boover from Belgium is asking, uh, Mr. Lanois, could you please tell us how do you get these rich, creamy sounds and so wide on all of your albums you produce? Okay, I understand. Rich, creamy sounds. Um, thank you for the question. And um, one way to get rich, creamy sounds is not to allow any shrill, harsh sounds into the work. So then, then your other work looks rich and creamy. So by, by, by just avoiding certain things, the work will be presented in a certain kind of light. Um, in the case of Goodbye to Language, which is the new record that um, we made for Anti Records in Los Angeles, myself and Rocco De Luca, um, we decided to stay full-bodied with our steel guitar sounds. Rocco plays a, a lap steel tuned down to D so he can get the, a nice low D note. So we often start in D. He sets the pitch and the tone, and he gets a beautiful full-bodied sound. Sometimes it sounds like a harmonium, like a, a little church organ. And um, it's very inspiring for me to hear those tones um, it, because it's what I like about some of the uh, Eastern music that I've heard, you know, when I listen to Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan, for example, I appreciate that he's got, uh, I believe his brother at the time, a, a lovely harmonium player, and he provides uh, that kind of ecclesiastical tonality to Nusrat's singing. And I like to include that in my work. We're not doing East Indian music, but that doesn't mean to say that we can't embrace some of those lovely low mid-range textures. They're often EQ'd up by modern engineers, and um, I, I'm a little bit old school about about that part of the spectrum, which is somewhere between 80 hertz and 400 hertz, up to 600 hertz. And oftentimes those frequencies get notched out on a graphic equalizer for having been accused of being muddy. But muddiness comes from carelessness, and if you have good... Um, performance in the low mid-range area, then why not celebrate it? So that's what we try and do. It comes from the, the source itself. It's not really, you know, uh, um, a matter of equalization or anything like that. So um, certain microphones promote the beauty of those frequencies, like ribbon microphones. RCA made some lovely ones, the 44 and the 77. Uh, and there's some modern 
Uh, ribbon microphone makers also make lovely mics, Coles and some other companies. And so we gravitate to those microphones because they are kind to low mids. So when people talk about the creaminess of the sound, it's not as simple as you push the cream button. You think um, what they might have thought in the 50s in the crooner era when Big Crosby sounded beautiful as Patsy Cline did, as Sinatra did, and so on. So there's a reason why they sounded that way. is because they sounded that way at the source. So if you're, scre- if you're screaming and you're screechy, then you will have screechy records. But if you have um, beautiful, creamy, and full-bodied sounds, then you have a better chance of having a record sound that way. Um... I think that's kind of enough on that. Uh, Thank you very much for your question about the creamy sounds.